And Frank, you're going to introduce our next testifier. Okay, thanks, Eric. And I want to introduce my friend, Carl Boggs. He's written 25 books, 10 on the topic of U.S. imperialism and militarism. That includes most, most recently, Origin, Origins of the Warfare State and the Hollywood War, Machine. He has been involved with anti-war uh, movement activities since the 1960s and was purged from his job as professor at Washington U University in St. Louis because of his anti-war work. Carl has been a regular contributor to Counterpunch since 1995. I've been reading his latest book, um, Facing Catastrophe. It's really a very heavy book. And I want to introduce Carl Box. Thank you, you so much, Carl? Frank. Thanks, thanks so much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yes. Good. Um, I'm so honored to be a part of this uh, wonderful event. Um, uh, and I want to thank Frank and Rachel and uh, Code Pink and everybody else involved. Um, I think it would be a very good idea, in fact, uh, to have something like this on a regular basis. Um, I was just thinking, uh, just sitting here, I was just thinking about the fact that it's been um, 55 years or 50, 55, something like that, years since I first got involved in anti-war activity, uh, fighting uh, US militarism and imperialism, fighting the uh, war in, in Vietnam. I was uh, one of the student uh, organizers for the uh, Vietnam Day Committee in uh, the spring of 1965 at UC Berkeley. And I believe it was one of, if not the first, one of the first major protests against the war in Vietnam. And uh, I was uh, very much involved in organizing that. It was right after the free speech movement in Berkeley. And then um, after that, I wound up uh, going to um, Washington University in St. Louis, where there was a very, very intense anti-war movement. Uh, our, our turnouts were thousands and thousands of people every single day uh, for weeks and months and a couple of years, we burned down two ROTC buildings. Uh, the FBI infiltrated uh, extensively. And after uh, a couple of years working at Washington University, I realized that one of my research assistants was uh, an FBI informant. And then one thing led to another and I was eventually just purged from the place. I was blacklisted. Uh, Basically, my job was finished, my career was finished, and I was blacklisted uh, by the uh, mid to late 70s. And uh, the uh, uh, corporate interests that ran the university included McDonnell Douglas, Monsanto, and a couple of others. So you can imagine uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the obstacles to uh, doing anti-war movement there were considerable. We did set up uh, a very historic uh, project called McDonnell Douglas Anti-Corporate Project. And it was an attempt, one of the few, I think, in the country to merge uh, working class struggles with anti-war struggles. And that lasted for a few years. And then uh, again, the university eventually put a, a crush uh, the kibosh on that. Um, I wanted to just mention, uh, a number of people have mentioned uh, the, the, uh, the issue of racism in US foreign policy. And I thought about the fact that um, in uh, the last over a century, the United States um, has done pretty much everything in its power uh, to destroy uh, six Asian countries. It hasn't completely succeeded, but not for, not for trying. The Philippines, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the element of racism in this was very, very intense. Uh, John Dower, uh, a historian, wrote a book, uh, War Without Mercy, talked about how the war in the Pacific was uh, considerably more racist than the war in Europe. And in fact, at one point, this is before Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, uh, under uh, the direction of Curtis LeMay, uh, the United States Air Force obliterated 66 German, uh, Japanese cities using incendiary uh, weapons, napalm, and all sorts of other devices that were basically anti-personnel uh, weapons. And uh, that was the lead up to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
So um, basically every major city in Japan was uh, annihilated. And that same um, modus operandi was carried forward into Korea, where at one point in time, in fact, um, President Truman was actually considering the use of uh, thermonuclear weapons there. Um, what's interesting there, and I was gonna talk a little bit about um, the nuclear complex, and of course, uh, that being part of the way in which the, the, the American power structure is able to establish um, uh, uh, its hegemony and maintain its hegemony and use its uh, leverage worldwide because um, the, uh, the whole issue of um, uh, you know, the war economy, the permanent war economy and uh, the uh, empire of bases and so forth uh, is solidified and magnified by the fact that there, there's um, the, the presence of such weapons of mass destruction. But what I've argued, and I've written about this uh, before, is that there are actually five different types of weapons of mass destruction. And the United States, of course, is the only country to have used them all. Uh, obviously, nuclear weapons in Japan, uh, chemical, weapon, uh, chemical weapons very extensively in the case of, uh, of Vietnam and uh, Indochina. And then in addition to that, uh, what's not very widely known is that um, biological warfare was introduced in Korea. And uh, it was not very successful, but it was used by the United States um, in Korea. And then two other weapons of mass destruction, one of which I just mentioned, was what I would call aerial terrorism. That is to say saturation bombing of uh, large cities with the, with the intent of basically leveling them and destroy, destroying uh, you know, the civilian population there. That would have to be considered uh, a weapon of mass destruction. And then the fifth, which the United States has used very liberally and very extensively over the last basically nearly a century is uh, economic sanctions. The worst of course being what the Clinton administration did uh, against Iraq uh, killing uh, upwards of a half a million people, mostly children, uh, in the 1990s. So the United States um, not only has conducted very extensively you know, forms of uh, racist warfare in the Pacific and elsewhere, but has conducted uh, these different uh, forms of uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, throughout. And um, again, uh, I think it's worth, because a lot of times people just think when they think of WMD, they think in terms of uh, they think in terms of uh, nuclear weapons, and that may be about it. But there are actually five different types, and the United States has relied upon those, uh, many of them fairly extensively, um, especially uh, aerial terrorism and uh, economic sanctions. Um, I just wanted to basically talk a little bit about the degree to which the nuclear complex fits so centrally into the American power structure. Today, the American power structure is not only the most um, powerful, uh, the most globalized, but also the most threatening power structure, I believe, in the history of the world. And the, um, the development of uh, nuclear, the nuclear complex and nuclear power fits very centrally with, within that. Um, one of the things the United States has done against the statutes of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, the NPT, uh, is to continue the modernization of nuclear weaponry, labs, facilities, deployments, subs, planes, uh, bomb types, tactical nuclear weapons, uh, networks in the field. Uh, there's an extensive uh, US nuclear deployment in Europe uh, so some some commentators have mentioned, and uh, that is continuing uh, and is, is uh, expanding uh, right now. Um, so th that is um, the process of modernization, which is earmarked really to cost about a trillion dollars over the next uh, three decades, is ongoing with the United States. That's an opposite. That's in violation of the nuclear. Um, uh, non-proliferation treaty, because um, uh, the treaty basically uh, injuncts, uh, it has an injunction 
that states that uh, you know all nuclear states should move towards uh, disarmament, and of course the United States is moving in just uh, the opposite direction. Um, what I wanted to just point out here is that I think at this point in time, we are at a point where I think the threat of global nuclear catastrophe is probably as great, if not greater, than at any point in recent history. And I think that's the case for uh, at least four reasons. One is this process of modernization. The process of modernization here, of course, uh, inspires the process of more modernization in Russia and China and elsewhere. It feeds into the nuclear arms races, which we continue to have. Um, even though the number of nuclear warheads is far less than what it was at the peak of the Cold War, where we had tens and tens of thousands, now there's globally maybe 15, 16,000 warheads. Uh, the fact is that the warheads that exist are much more powerful, much more accurate, uh, and much more efficient than the earlier warheads. So it's misleading to think that there's been some sort of reduction in overall you know, nuclear uh, power uh, uh, available in the world. Um, the threat of, of uh, accidental war is also much greater at this point in time, uh, owing to um, the possibilities of, of uh, computer malfunction, um, faulty intelligence, power failures, human error, um, cyber warfare, all these things have, I think, exacerbated the threat of accidental nuclear war. Uh, we know, and I think, I, I think that it's um, pointed out in uh, Dan Ellsberg's book uh, um, that um, I think we've had six episodes just since the early 1980s of near, uh, near uh, nuclear war coming from uh, this kind of uh, accidental situation. Third, um, we see uh, a mounting conflict between the United States and Russia with the US NATO push uh, to, uh, you know, eastward with deployments um, near Russian borders um, and military exercises there, economic sanctions, ongoing threats. Um, this has been a process at particularly intense since uh, the 90s with the dismemberment of Yugoslavia, the attack on Serbia, then subsequent attacks on, um, uh, you know, on, on involvements in Georgia and Ukraine, bringing the United States much closer to um, an intense geopolitical conflict with Russia. That is continuing. And of course, what's exacerbated that is Russiagate. Um, which um, has produced uh, a new Cold War between the United States and Russia. And now we have a situation where the two nuclear powers are facing off against each other under the most tense of conditions. We know also, uh, and Eric Mann mentioned this and some others have mentioned it as well, uh, we know that um, one of the neocon uh, objectives is um, to uh, target Russia, hoping to isolate and weaken uh, the country, um, if not very basically carry out some form of regime change. I believe re regime change is basically on the agenda here as far as the neocons uh, are concerned. I would say a fifth problem uh, contributing to the possible um, intensification of, uh, or the possible increasing threat of thermonuclear war is uh, the problem of nuclear proliferation. And uh, that is not anything that the United States or any country uh, really presently has done much to correct. So I would uh, argue that um, uh, the political alternative here is that given the present threat that we face, um, the, only, uh, the only solution is some sort of radical move towards full-scale nuclear disarmament consistent with uh, the dictates of the, national, the NPT. That should be a prevailing goal of humanity. Unfortunately, it is the American power structure described above that remains the biggest impediment to such um, historic move. And insane and immoral US foreign policy must be changed 
and very soon. And I think the fact that we see these recent moves towards the demonization, or we should say the further demonization of Russia and Putin are not exactly contributing to this uh, process. And I just make one final comment. I think it's really a sad commentary to think the degree to which many, uh, many progressives and many leftists are sort of bought into this demonization process. It's not really helping uh, the cause of peace. It's only helping the cause of war. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carl. Very important testimony. We're going to have more on Cold War and the environment at the end of the program in the chat and a little bit um, live.